The following categories give you the list of functions that can be used in the windowing logic. So you can use aggregates, ranks, functions for statistics, distribution, and also positional activities. So these functions become really handy once used via the windowing logic. We're going to start with using the aggregate functions in our lab now. We'll start with creating the employee table and insert some data. And some of you might have already done that in the previous lab. All right, so we have employee ID, employee names, the department that they work in, their salary, and their age. So that's the data we are working with. So let's start with finding the total salary per department. Right, so you know from the previous lecture, we can use a group by department name to get the total salary by summing it up. Here you can see the group by class has grouped each department and summed up the total salary. Let's say you want to calculate the average and the total sum of all the salaries in the table presented in a way that the actual number of records in the table still show when you run the query. For that, you're going to use the over clause, which initiates the windowing process. So we're going to do the aggregate function of sum, pass in the column that we want to aggregate on, then the over clause, and just give it a label. Same thing with the average. We're going to give it the column name, over clause, and the label, and just run the script. So as you can see, we got all our records in the employee table. Employee ID, employee name, department name, and salary. So we have 11 records showing up. But if you look at the last two columns, the total salary and the average salaries. So what this over clause did was summed up all the salaries of all employees and listed it at every row along with the average salary at every row. Our third script is asking us to sum up the amounts for Mary and Barbara where each amount they paid is greater than $5. So for that, we have to join the customer table and the corresponding payment table. So we're going to join those two tables on customer ID. We're still using the where clause where amount is greater than five and the name is Mary and Barbara. So if you look at our select statement, we want to know which month they paid these amounts in. We're summing up the amount and then using the over clause and then giving a total payment. So let's run this. Here you can see the Mary's transactions. In June, she had two transactions that were greater than $5. In July, she had three transactions. But if you look at the total payment, the over function is adding up all these amounts and showing it at each row, sum of all these amounts together. So this kind of shows you the aggregation being shown with the detailed records. Our fourth script is a little variation from the third script. In script three, we were not grouping or partitioning the windowing function, but here we're gonna introduce a partitioning clause and we're gonna partition by each customer. So we're gonna partition by Mary and then we're gonna partition by Barbara. So the script is pretty much the same. The only difference we have is that when we sum the amount and use the over clause, in the over clause, open bracket, we're going to use the partition by clause, and we're going to partition by customer ID. Let's see the results. If you see now, so the total amounts are aggregated by the customer. So all of Mary's amounts have been totaled up and all of Barbara's amount have been totaled up. This partition by clause comes really handy when we want to partition on a particular column using the windowing function. So you can see the total amounts here, $41.94, only relate to Mary Smith's transaction when you sum these up. Great. I've added a slide to explain these results further. Calculating the total payment amount for each customer and showing their detailed records alongside it. So if you see, we summed the amount and used the over clause and then used partition by customer ID and labeled as total payments. So if you look at the last column, using the partition by clause created two partitions in our result set, one for Mary and one for Barbara. 
and by using the partition keyword you're able to isolate your aggregate functions to be only applied on that partition. Hopefully this visual was helpful. In our fifth script we want to calculate the total and average salary per department and list the total employees per department as well. You had seen the employee table. We had employee name, department, and salary and their age. We're going to use the over clause. We can also use the partition by, we're going to partition by department. So, so here you can see the first three records relate to the HR department. Salaries are here. So the total salary per department. So this 12,900 is the sum of these three salaries in the HR department because we partition by department name. Likewise, the average salary per department and the total employees. So we have three employees. Now let's take a scenario where we want to calculate the running sum of the paid amounts per month by customer where the each transactions are greater than $5 for Mary and Barbara. So the script remains the same. The only portion that will change is that we're going to add the order by paid month clause after the partition by customer ID. So what this does is that it further segments out the data by month after it has already grouped by the customer ID. So let's run this. If you look at Mary's transactions, we have months six, seven, and eight. So we have three months in which the transactions are split. So for month of June, this windowing function added up the two transactions for the month of June. Then it came and added the transactions for the month of June plus the month of July. So 35.95 is adding transactions for all the month of July and June. The last transaction for Mary for the month of August is $41.94. So it adds $5.99 to the $35.95 we calculated in the previous row. So $45.94 is the total for all these amounts for all these months as well. It's a running total as it keeps adding the transaction amounts as the current row moves down. If you don't specify a row and range and give a particular boundary, the default is range between unbounded preceding and current row. Let's try to understand this through a visual aid. So when we use the windowing function and do the order by payment month, if we don't use any range or don't set any boundaries, by default, MySQL will process this as a range clause and then do between unbounded preceding and current row. If you look at the results set, if the order by value is the same, in this case for the month of July, we have three transactions, range would calculate the aggregation for that block of data together. And that's why you see $35.95 being repeated for each row for the month of July as the calculation happens on that logical group. Hopefully this visual will help you differentiate between a row and a range calculation. Now let's update the previous script and add another windowing function where we are actually explicitly saying rows between unbounded preceding and the current after the order by clause and leave the other running total payment range as is. Let's run this. So the running total payment rows, what it does is that it adds the amounts row by row. It's like a physical row gets added to the total amount. It does not matter if the month is the same, but if you compare the range running total, if it sees the month being the same, it adds the total amounts and give the same amount on those two rows. Then it comes to the month of July, it add all the July and the previous. The difference between rows and range is that the order by clause does not impact the row calculation and it basically works its aggregation on each row as it goes through. On the other hand, range basically logically groups based on the order by and calculates the total sum based on the order by column. 
Let's look at the rows calculation through a visual aid. So the moment we use the rows keyword, the framing happens at each row. So as rows are being added, the frame gets bigger. As you can see from the visual on the right side that the frame 1 through frame 6 is an increment from the first row to the last row. So as the frame goes bigger, the total sum or the running sum gets added as the current row goes down to the last row of Mary's transaction and likewise with Barbara. Now let's say if you want to calculate a moving sum, meaning that a sliding window that goes through our set of records. We'll keep the rest of the script the same. We'll still use the sum of the amount over clause partitioned by customer ID and the order of the month remains the same. So this information we are not changing. We're going to add rows between and give a boundary of one preceding and current row. Likewise, we can also add the range between one preceding and current row and see how our calculations are different between rows and range. Let's run the script. If you look at our rows column, so moving total payment rows paid amount one day. So we have a one day prior sliding window. So now we have $5.99. So we don't have any prior row. It's just going to represent $5.99. As you go to the next column, it's going to add one previous amount and this amount and put $15.98. As it moves forward, it's just going to only add one previous amount because if you look at the last row, the reason why we have $13.98 is because it, it added $5.99 to $7.99. So it's a sliding window with one month prior by using the row between one preceding and current row. If you look at the range calculation, it again summed up the two amounts based on the payment month. So for the month of June, we have $15.98. As it went through the next set of month, it added again for the month of July. So it added July payments to the June payments, but it repeats it for the same month. So if you look at the last row of Mary and look at total moving payment range payment one day, it's $25.96. The reason it is $25.96 is because it added $5.99 to these three transactions in July. So knowing the difference between rows and range calculation becomes really helpful as you start doing your analysis. Let's look at the sliding effect using the rows clause through a visual aid. So this slide is showing you a moving total payment for each customer by month. And we are able to achieve that by setting up a boundary and by saying rows between one preceding and current. And if you look at the framing, it basically has two rows as it moves through their data set. And it's called a sliding window. If we would have used between two preceding and current, the window would have had at the most three records as it's moving through the table. Let's review the components of the window function. You can apply your regular aggregate functions through the windowing logic, like use your average, min, max, sum, and rank functions, and many more. The expression list is where we have the column indicated on which the function runs. Window functions are initiated with the over clause. Partition by list specifies dividing the rows into groups. You can also control the order in which the rows are processed by the window functions using the order by clause, ascending or descending. Rows and range frame clause allows us to operate on a subset of the partitions by breaking the partition into even smaller sequences of rows. The frame clause lets you limit the number of rows within a partition by specifying a start and end point. Let's try to expand the row and range capability of the windowing function. The additional framing clause uses either a row or a range and then sets up a boundary using the between clause.
these expressions can fall into different categories of being either unbounded preceding, unbounded following, and few others. If you look at the diagram, the unbounded preceding and the unbounded following represents the first row of the partition and then the last row of the partition. So that kind of sets the boundary. You can also set a custom boundary by giving an offset for number preceding and number following from the current row. The default frame is range between unbounded preceding and current row. Range clause treats the duplicate values as single entity versus row clause uses them as separate. Row frames are based on physical offsets and range frames are more logical in nature. We will look at more examples which will make the difference between row and range frames much more clearer. Window functions are one of the coolest features I think uh, SQL has. Once you know the mechanics of working with window functions, you can use it for different use cases and calculate the desired metrics. The windowing process lets you divide the result set into groups of rows called partitions. And then frames let you operate on even a subset of partition data by breaking partitions into smaller sequences of rows. There are a lot of functions that can be applied via the windowing concept. Some of the use cases that can use the window function if you want to calculate the top 10 products this year by total sales, if you want to calculate moving averages or running totals, we will go through some scenarios where you can see how window functions can be used. You can apply the window function on a particular column while still maintaining the detail of the whole table. Like if you remember in our group by functions, we used to get data that used to condense the number of records based on the group by column. But with window functions, you can still maintain the detailed set of records of the table and still apply grouping on the data based on different aggregate functions. So the windowing concept becomes really important when you're trying to see the data in its totality. Next, we'll see how the window function is constructed and what are the components that make a window function work. Positional window function helps navigate data location in a result set and are helpful in business reporting. Lag and lead functions let you either access the data before the current row or after the current row, depending on the offset you give. First value and last value gives you either the first or the last value in an ordered set. Let's look at these functions in practice. So what script one is doing is it's calculating the first and the last value of the employee ID partitioned by department name. So it's a pretty simple script and it give you the first employee and the last employee. So if you see, we are getting frame first row, we are getting the first employee here, and frame last row, we are getting the last employee here, which is Grace Lee. Pretty simple, straightforward function. Let's try to run script two, which is calculating the lag and the lead function or the employee ID partitioned by department name and ordered by ID. So we are ordering it by ID. So let's run that. If you look at the HR department, we have three employees. So for the first employee, there's no previous row. If you don't give an offset or a default value for lag and lead, so it's going to basically set the offset by one record. So lag would be one record before and lead would be one record after. So the next row, which is using the lead function, is going to be two and three from the current row, so it just gives you that. For the third employee in this particular partition, there's no next record, and it's going to be null. But if you use the offset for the lead function, like in this case I've used two, that means that the function would fetch record from two rows down. So when you're on the first row on employee one, two records down would be Grace Lee, so we are getting three here for the lead with setting an offset of two. But there are no records after two records from two. That's why we're getting null, null. 
By using the leak and lag offset, you can really navigate the data that you have in the table within the partition. So for every new partition, the window function would start again. Ranking is another category of windowing functions that gets used a lot. Rank functions can be used to calculate the top number of records in a data set. Rank functions assign the same ranks to equal rows versus dense rank that has no gaps, hence the term dense. Entail slices the data into the given number of subdivisions you give, and row number just gives a physical number to each row in your partition. Let's see these functions in practice. I really like rank functions, so we're going to be using the employee table for running our rank examples. I want to update one of the salary records for employee 5 so we can see the difference between the rank and dense rank. Please run that update statement. Right, for script 1, we want to calculate the rank and dense rank on the salary of the employee. So we're going to use the keyword rank, open and close bracket, over partition by department name. So for every department, I want to rank the salary. Same thing I want to do with dense rank, dense underscore rank, open and close bracket, over partition by department and order by salary. So I want the ranking by salary within a department. So let's run this. So if you see HR gets 1, 2, 3 rank and dense rank 1, 2, 3. So far, rank and dense rank is giving us the same ranks. Let's go to production department. If you look, the first row of production gets both ranks as one. Second and third gets two because the salary is the same. But the fourth record with rank function gets four and dense rank gets three. So here you can see there's a gap in the rank function. It's skipping three but the dense rank does not skip and there are no gaps when using the dense rank. And so it systematically says one, two, two, three, and four. On the other hand, rank says one, two, two, four, and five. So I prefer using dense ranks for this reason. Let's say if you want to calculate the top five employees by salary. What we can do is we can apply the dense rank function use the over clause and just order by salary descending. So we want the highest salary first and lowest at the bottom. And we are not partitioning by department right now because we just want the top five salaries regardless of the department. So we are using an inline SQL right here. So if you look at the brackets, this particular select is giving you a dense rank for the highest salary is one and then kind of goes down all the way down to eight. But we are looking for the top five employees. So we need to filter this data further. So to filter the SQL inside, we will use another SQL outside this and keep this SQL in close brackets, give it an alias. So the whole script inside will get an alias of X. So we'll say select star from the inner SQL alias X where salary underscore dense rank is less than or equal to five, which is filter these records where salary dense rank is less than or equal to five. So if we run that, we should get the top five employees by salary. There you go. So it's a handy way of getting an N number of people within a group based on a particular metric. Let's look at script two. We want to basically use the N tile function to split the payment data of the customers into four groups. How are we going to do that? So we're going to use an n tile function, open bracket four. Basically, this gives you how many slices you need of the data over, which initiates the window function, order by the amount descending as quartile. And we're going to join the payment and the customer table on the customer ID. So basically, we want to see the amounts paid by the customer and then group them into four distinctive groups. Let's run this. If you look at the quartile column, it's assigning these rows group one. If you scroll down to records, we have some records assigned as two, 
sum as 3, and then 4. So this is an easy way to categorize the number of records in your table to a particular given group using the ental function and giving a particular number of groups you need in this parentheses right here. In script 3, we're going to be calculating the top earning employee per department. So for every department, I want the highest paid employee. We're going to use the row underscore number function, partition the data by department name, and then order the salary descending. We, row numbers basically assign just a number to each physical row. If we run the script highlighted on the screen, we're going to get a sequential number assigned to each row in our employees table. So for HR department, we are getting one, two, three, and then the ordering is based on salary descending. The way we can filter this record and only bring records where the employee rank is equal to one, we need to have an outer SQL, select star from, open brackets and close bracket where we have the inline SQL, give it an alias X where employee rank equals one. So let's run this. So this gives us the highest paid employees in each department based on the salary. Hopefully these examples help you understand the ranking functions.